I was raised on boom bap, music composed by hood rats. I like the way they talked, I like the way they wore their cool hats. I like the anger in their voice, he sighed for the New York footpaths. I started wearing baggies, jewelry, khaki, hoodies, new hats. And Paul Oak, everybody was wearing Kappa doggies. I was bumping Biggie Smalls and Wu-Tang. And Kane, this is cool, man. And Eminem drove and it had me. OK, cool, I could do that. No pads full of new raps, falling out my school bags. Taking crap for all the boys, I blocked it out and foot tapped. MTV based in Westwood taping shows when I was out so I could run rings around all these boys on a football pitch and go home and do that. Well, they were drinking, talking, tripping, claiming who was bushwhacked. This is the history of Scottish hip hop. For me, hip hop started here in Pollock. Feeling isolated and culturally alienated in a housing scheme, the only two things that resonated with me growing up were Batman and American hip hop. Rap was people talking about many of the things I was experiencing as a young man in Scotland. So I began rapping as a means of expressing my feelings. I've been open about my own history of poverty, addiction and mental health issues. Those subjects helped form many of the lyrics to my songs. But since then, I took that openness into the literary realm with my book Poverty Safari. Without hip hop, I wouldn't be where I am now. So what is Scottish hip hop anyway? Being real, being raw, being a fetish. It's life. It's what I do. It's what I wake up in the morning and do. I just have my own style, have my own accent. It's homegrown. Hip hop has contributed significantly in many different ways to the world that we're currently living in. Living and breathing, we see it everywhere, every city, every town. A way how to express myself. It's actually something I was quite proud of to be Scottish hip hop. And putting all your cards out on the table and just going for it. Identity. Like I was walking into a, a community. The old Scottish hip hop came with a hard back. It's something that we created for us, by us. The essence of where you come from. I like the community aspect of the whole thing, but. For me, it was really all about painting. It's the breaking. Then it's the graffiti, the, the music, the, the rapping. It reminds me of the, like, the South Side, Glasgow South Side in the 80s. But it is really important to see that it wasn't just a central Scottish culture and that it actually took root all over the place in the same way that it took root all over the world. Most people think that Scottish hip hop is a new thing, but with over 30 years of history, Scottish hip hop is built on a strong foundation. We have world-class producers in Hudson Mohawk making beats for Kanye West and Drake. Richie Roughtone is the most successful battle DJ in Britain's history. Our streets have been transformed by artists that honed their skills painting graffiti on buildings and track sides and we have some of the most dynamic and original musicians expressing themselves with their own voice. So let's go back to the start, break down the culture, and hear from some of the pioneers of Scottish hip hop. What we need to acknowledge is that we're all standing on the shoulder of giants. We're all able to do what they, we do because somebody else did it first. And actually it is important in hip hop why is it important to acknowledge reality and document it properly? Because that's what hip hop's about. It's a core element of hip hop is to show respect for the history and the forefathers, if you like, or the, the creators that came before you. Because the one thing that people really, really have to be made aware of, there's always been talent. Breakdancing was my gateway into hip hop. I discovered it through watching, I think, an Adidas advert on TV, discovered graffiti, discovered the music and was blown away and changed my life forever. Hip-hop culture is broken into four different areas called pillars. These are breakdancing, DJing, MCing and graffiti art. The origins of these four pillars in Scotland started with the breakdancing scene in the early 1980s. It was just, it was nationwide, like, you crazed to hit the nation, you know, break dancing, you know, and it, everybody was exposed to it, you couldn't escape it. It was one of those trends that came out. They were walking about the street, blasting my ghetto blaster, going up and buying lino up the barras and and back to the scheme, spinning all day and all night. 83 comes along, everybody stops fighting. 
everybody stops fighting and the maddest thing is they're dancing against each other. They're actually dancing against each other. What's going on, man? Moved on my mum's furniture and she'd freak out. What are you doing? I'm like, my practice, you know, it's like... I met Smiz, aka Crash Slaughter. He sent me tapes of all the quality hip-hop and like, I practised it in my room. It seemed to grasp your attention straight away and developing it was great. The camaraderie of somebody finding a new move, you know, like, do that again, they like, do what? I don't know what I've done. And it's like, well, you did this kind of thing. That's how the move started. What is interesting for back then is, is like, we would learn a move and then you would see somebody in Glasgow doing it and you go, how? I invented that. We used to do head spins in the concrete because we didn't know any better. You get an empty crisp packet, you get the cover of an old album that you didn't like and use that and, until somebody got a bad line, you know. And I remember it was the Gary Bird experience, the crown, the GB, the crown, that 12 inch on the floor in my bedroom with the bed up against the wall doing head spins. And one of my neighbours asking my mum, what's your mark doing? He's uh, dancing. Dancing? Oh, I can see his two feet spinning around in circles. And <laughs> That's like a martial art. That's something that there's no quarters. And um, if you got any breaking, you had to try and be as best that you could possibly be. I wanted our dance to be watched by the world th through the same eyes as somebody watching the best ballet in the world. You know, that takes all your life to dedicate to be good, the same as that does. The popularity of breakdancing or breaking peaked with the legendary battles between rival crews at the Plaza Ballroom in Glasgow from 1984 to 1986. Two of these crews were the Glasgow City Breakers and the Laser City crew from Irvine. First time they walked through that door, the first thing that hit you was the music. Battles at the Plaza. It was an amazing place. Plaza was a place where you actually seen hip hop culture face to face. Oh, the Plaza, there's loads of stories about the Plaza. So Glasgow City Breakers and LCC, all the, all the battles that they had. Um, and that's not just famous in Scotland. It is a world famous institution in Glasgow. The ballroom dancing there for the 50s, probably earlier. Everybody just came there and Fortunately for us, we were the best crew, crew there. <laughs> I have definitely heard the stories of the rivalry, even to this day, they still wind each other up. The first battle that we had with them was so intense. It, it was almost ferocious, like, like a fight, like young guys fighting, you know, because it was like, it's just as good as us. The energy levels in their battles were unbelievable. We had everybody in that plaza around a small six, like a six foot circle. And I thought I was in a, a coliseum at one point. I've looked up and they got all the chairs. You know, people couldn't see. So they started piling the chairs on the chairs and they were on that. And I was like, God, shit, you know, it was deafening. It was dark. The, the atmosphere, you could have cut it with a knife. There ended up like 800 at the start, taking on to like 1,500 kids for every Glasgow housing scheme, West Coast, coming from up north, and et cetera, et cetera, you know. We were 20 young people from the scheme, various abilities of break dancing, but a pure passion for it. Every scheme had its own crew anyway, breaking. Hip hop was everywhere in Glasgow at the time. This is you watching guys for Castle Milk battling guys for Penny Lee, and guys for Irvine battling guys for Pollock. And it's like, he's for Pollock, I'm for, I can do that. Everybody came from everywhere, and initially people thought, I'm not going to Penny Lee, it's, it's a nightmare. You don't, you don't go there, it's cars getting stolen, houses and drugs and everything, you know, there was a. That press was always in Glasgow, you're always going to get it. Still, people didn't get it, didn't understand it, you know, why? Now, you kind of tell people, oh, we don't be in gangs and fight anymore with dance, because that just sounded silly back then, because violence was rife. It's 
when you get a wee bit older, you're like, oh man, my life could have been totally different. I was at that really impressionable age that, as we know through history, things can take dark turns in people's lives. But for me personally, hip hop came along and it educated me, it entertained me, it elevated me, um, it shaped me. Much like the other pillars of hip hop, graffiti art evolved in the walls and subways of America, originating in Philadelphia, followed closely by New York. Graffiti art in Scotland first displayed popular breakdance phrases copied from films, mimicking styles and using cheap car paint in abandoned buildings and beside railway tracks. Often risking their lives and their liberty, graffiti artists go to great lengths to get their name up. Tragically, Grant Hamilton, who wrote the name Mode, lost his life while tagging on a train track in Glasgow at the end of 2018, showing the stark reality of the immense risks involved in painting illegal graffiti. Grant was a father, you know, he had a nine-month-year-old kid, he had a fiancé there, you know, but he, he just went out and done what he loved doing, being a graffiti artist, you know, and I use that word artist. Grant was an artist. To some it's vandalism, to others it's art. We explore the controversial world of graffiti and how it has evolved to become recognised by the public with giant murals in cities across the country. Around about October, November 85, breaking seemed to die down and then Style Wars came out, it hit Channel 4 um, and then the next day it was just like everybody was in, into graffiti and people were painting everywhere. There was two books that showed you kind of what was going on. They were the Bible and the New Testament, as they could be recalled. But uh, the whole the whole idea being, you look at stuff and then you go and develop your style off off that. You were even looking at those pictures in that book through a magnifying glass to see what marker pens they were using. I wrote graffiti because it was fun and it was relatively cheap and I was already at art. It kind of made sense. You know what I mean? I was shit at football. People do this thing because it's fun. It's a thrill. It's a buzz. I think firstly they're creatives. The creators with the opportunities. We didn't have access to anything, you know, there wasn't any internet or magazines or images or anyone else. In Edinburgh, we developed our own style with, on, on its own, you know. And up in Dundee, it was really abstract kind of styles that these guys were doing. I mean, you've got the, the pioneers of Glasgow, you've got Mac One, you've got As One that came out of St Stirling, you've got the Easy Riders. There's a lot of things I could say that are, are good about it. I like, the, I like creating, though. I like adding to society, you know? There's this misconception that graffiti writers are out there and like want to damage everything and fuck everything up, but it's it's the opposite for me. Don't take away the grassroots. You know, you've got the city mural trail, and I put it to the city mural trail that those works of art never sprung up overnight. <laughs> So my transition was uh, just uh, use, uh, technically I suppose it would be using illegal graffiti as a way of practicing to then move on to more serious graffiti where I was trying to do elaborate and fancy images and mural work and things like that. So um, the illegalness was a sense of practicing the spray paint really. I don't draw a line between the two of them, I think it's all art. Banksy still does illegal art, it is still illegal. The fact that it's been covered by the media, the fact that he's got a massive marketing team behind him, you know, 
does that make it legal? And you get like people that talk about like big murals and they love all this, but they hate the tags. But you can't get all the murals. You don't, you know, the murals came from the tags. And most people that do all those murals have got a tag. Tag's just a signature. And the big full colour or like lettering that you see, that's just an elaborate version of a tag. Street arts, it's, it's the fucking coffee morning a graph. It's like, it's, you know, the, the village fair. It's, it's just dead safe to bring the kids down and fucking like watch the guys painting and stuff like that, but, it, but it's no real. It's cool, you know, I appreciate it for what it is, but it's not graffiti. I've always thought if you paint graph, you need to pay your dues and, and kind of get up and get out and start after the tags and don't just show up and paint a bit of art, kitten on a unicycle juggling. What the fuck's that all about? I think without graffiti, the place is dead, it's sterile. And I think with graffiti, it just shows that people are out there taking, taking their own initiative you know, rather than uh, just going and doing everything they're told. And why, why, would every, why would anyone, you know, think that that's the society that we should live in? Art or crime? Yeah, is graffiti vandalism? Is it, is it a talent? I think it's both. The DJ was the start of the music scene within hip-hop. The origins come from New York block parties where DJs sought out ways of extending the best part of the record called a break. This gave the opportunity for the break dancers to show off their moves. This is how it started, take two copies of a record and then wrap over the top of it, keep the break going. DJ is the most important thing in hip hop. I don't say that from an egotistical perspective, I say that from a historical perspective. DJ invented the sounds. DJ is the sound of hip hop. I always collected vinyl from the early days and I've got masses of it. I, I love the music, that was what hip hop was for me. Further advances included scratching, <laughs> cutting, and transforming. <laughs> Hip-hop clubs struggled to find weekend slots across the country, with a diet of house and techno nights dominating the menu. But pioneers in Glasgow and Edinburgh maintained a commitment to provide enthusiasts with new records imported from the States. From DJing, many turned to the studio to produce music, firstly using innovative tape loops, then progressing to the first digital drum machines and samplers. I used to just make mad paused loop tape. We used to jam a pencil in between my records so that the, the tape loop would go around like that. I got my parents' turntable set up with a computer tape deck and I was doing like spin backs with a computer tape. I swapped one of my mates who was in another breaking crew at the time, a kappa jacket. For he, I gave him a kappa jacket and he gave me a turntable and the turntable had a volume on and off, like an actual fader, and that was it. That's when I learned, like, you no, know, the timing and, oh, what, I. And it was going for a four track, on to like an Amiga. No matter what your musical background or skill, there's an Amiga music software package suited to your needs. Never done any of this at college or anything, you know, never knew how to, how to record music or anything, so it was just a process of, you, you learn it, you get the software, you get the hardware, and keep doing what you can. And you always find a way around things, so that's just the way I was when it came to production, you know, like, you're given something and you try and make the most out of it. Originally intended to hype up the crowd for the DJ, MCs started expanding their repertoire to become far more than just shout-outs to encourage the crowd. What we now know as rapping evolved from simple wordplay to cover a variety of subject matters. MCing in Scotland started pretty much as a carbon copy of American rap, often using American accents to imitate what they were hearing. As Scottish MCs started to find their own voice in the early 90s, it became clear that as they were speaking about local issues, they should use a local accent. When folk say they're rapping about keeping it real, 
and you're like, mate, you're for Paisley or Glasgow, wherever you're for, but you know what I mean? You sound like you're, you're for LA, what's, what's happening, you know? Come on, man, it's time to go. With the same old flow. Yeah, check it out, Davey. Come on. I understand why people started off, obviously you're going to start off rapping like America, because that's what we're listening to. You know, there's no benefit in using a different accent, really, do you know what I mean? Uh, we're not American, you know, we're not London, you know, and hip hop's always about being real, you know, being real to yourself and putting out kind of honest music and things. You're rapping about like, you know, rough cast and potholes and fuck fast and all this stuff, but you're doing it in a, in a fake American accent. And, the, and finally, listening back to it myself, I was like, I can't tell these stories and use that voice because the two just don't fit together. Can you rap in an American accent? Right, can I do that, right? But I hate how I sound there. I'm not, I, I can't, do you know what I mean? It's like, that Scottish accent sounds better, but how should it? But it's, it does. I think it's extremely important for anyone to rap in their own accent. I think it makes things much more real. I have to rap how, how I talk. So I think like all artists and rappers should always rap how, as close to how they talk as possible. I think when people hear me, you know, they're like, oh, you've got a broad Scottish accent, you know? Oh, you're more Scottish than me. I'm like, I'm from here, do you know what I mean? I know I don't look like I am, but I am. If I want people to believe in me, but how can they believe in somebody that sounds fake? How can I get comfortable hearing my own voice? And that ties into this thing in Scottish culture, us being comfortable and seeing ourselves reflected in the media. Scottish people hate their own accent. Scottish people, for some reason, detest to hear themselves on TV, radio, media. Can't understand it. It ties into the Scottish cringe, which is a real thing. When we went Scottish, we went raw Scottish. We went pure scheme dialect at first. Our first song was called But We Are Different. And it was about being Scottish rappers, not American rappers, but different. And we used all the local vernacular. But we are different. So I see three more people I see. And but I'm nothing again. You don't need to check. I see you be your race on me. Just be your way through a man like your exist. And the rest is We just went to use a Glasgow term, we went boss it. And it was actually it was actually funny, mate, because it was like gone from one extreme to the other. It was like, yes y'all. You talk to we jumped the queue, so we were first sharp wanted evolve with eyes on the back of our heads, paint on the wall to remember the day that the rich kids they all call us Ned. And we we copped a lot of flack for it. And we did introduce it to lots of people. There was lots of people similar to, to, to Loki who discovered the Scottish accent, maybe maybe getting used in a, in a professional environment for the first time through us. And I guess it is sort of shocking. I guess it is, well, what the fuck? We felt we were morally obligated to do it above all other things. We felt we were only representing the guys in my, my locality and my scheme and all that, the way that we should be. And that's what hip hop's all about. Hip hop's about telling your story, about for where you're fae. It's taken so long, it's taken decades for Scottish accent to be acceptable in, as a standard rather than as a novelty in, in Scottish music. And uh, that the fact that there's not been Scottish accent rap appearing in commercially successful music is just a byproduct of that. It's the accent. It's hard to access for a lot of people. They, they struggle understanding Scottish. You ever tried voice recognition technology? No. They don't do Scottish accents. Eleven. Could you please repeat that? It's Marmite. Do you know what I mean? People uh, either get it or they don't get it. You have not <laughs> selected a floor. I we have! We're, we're Scottish, we're stubborn, we, we want to do things we're in way and maybe sometimes that has held us back slightly. Maybe we should just say please. I'm not begging that for nothing. I don't want to sound like a dick either, right, but if no one's listening to your music it's probably not because of your accent either. Although hotly debated, there were a few vinyl released at the start of the 90s that were competing to be the first official Scottish hip-hop release. To me, the guys who were edgy or, or, or really original and really, really unique was the two-tone committee. Cultural significance of what two-tone did is it, still influencing people now. Hearing two-tone coming out my radio, listening to Radio 1 one night and going, that again was another thing that makes you go, hold on, 
Sugar Bullet released the track Demonstrate in Mass in 1990. It was kicking back. You know, it was music that was kicking back, had that sort of slightly sort of punky, you know, ethos to it and had that sort of like, had that sort of aggro sound to it. Aberdeen Group, Dope Incorporated, releasing The Frontal Attack. The Frontal Attack. These first two releases were both protest songs, showing that right from the word go, Scottish hip-hop wasn't afraid to face issues head-on. These two in particular are, for, are significant for one reason, and they're, they're both protest songs against the poll tax. Scottish hip-hop has been a voice in turbulent times, retaining its unique identity. A diverse group of artists representing a modern Scotland are telling their own stories using their own voices. Conscious is providing the backbeat to many of the new breed of MCs coming through. Shogun from Paisley was the first Scottish MC to break a million views on YouTube. Been a little bit fucked lately. And I don't want to be another stereotype. I got a robot but man, it's really fucked even years old. Thinking about it in my life, I don't give a fuck for your judgment. You're lucky to only throw punches when I break. Shogun is, is outstanding with, with his lyrics, and obviously he's made a big impact south of the border as well. So it's really exciting to see what he's doing. And then when Shogun came out, it was like a breath of fresh air. I'm saying this is a, an MC who is really sane something lyrically and again with a Scottish accent. For a local act as well from somebody from Paisley, it was just so refreshing to see that well, we can actually do that. Ransom FA from Aberdeen had the first video from a Scottish hip hop artist played on a London based channel. I'm in a world of my own, sometimes I'm in a world of my own, I just close my eyes and my thoughts go rogue, if I let it all out I just might explode, end of the place and it feels like home, not tally in but I'm out to go, that's just the way it goes, come enter the energy zone. Gasp is staying true to himself, producing intelligent, provocative rhymes and pushing the boundaries of video with a DIY attitude. Often underrepresented, women in hip hop are making their own voices heard. People are saying, oh well it's Scotland and it's small so we don't need to or we can't do this or we can't, we can do anything we want to do. So what's the grand plan on this grandstand? Like grandstand, we better calm down. New world is a sham, like one down from girl to man. What is the plan, Sam? Like, oh no, it's the honeys and your go po no, it's the big show. Scotch laws over Scottish tech, no, clearly here we fucking go. You need to just get up and do it. No one's going to do it for you. Still living one time after my real people. They don't steal people. They went to their jokes up and don't carry steal people. Go fetch your career dog. You can't evoke the mic. I do this part-time son and you talk full-time shite. Tapping for the light, standing looking at me half right. From the old to the new, Scottish hip-hop has retained that old saying from a legendary New York rapper. It ain't where you're from, it's where you're at. <laughs>